Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Blake. Today I'm interviewing a children's book illustrator that happens to be my husband. His name's Stephen Henry. He's published over 14 books. I've worked on a few of them with him as the writer though, not the artist. Here's an example of one we did together. It's called Welcome to Morningtown. And there's a lot of really nice examples of cross hatching and uh, beautiful illustrative line work that he uses that I think that I could learn something from. And we did a sequel to this called Goodnight Sleepyville. I also worked on a book with him called Something Smells. I often feel like I need to expand my mark making vocabulary because I will start painting and then I'll run out of ideas. I always use the same ones over and over again. I use my lines, my ladders, and my dots. And because Steve uses a lot of mark making in his illustrations, I thought we could sit down today and talk about how he does that. And at the end, I'd like to collaborate with him and work on a piece together and see if we can integrate his mark making techniques with my abstract painting. Could you show us some of the children's books that you've worked on and just some examples of line work that you've used? Uh, this one is done in kind of a pen and ink style and there's a lot of different marks in here. Um, everything from these little marks here kind of showing a surface area. Uh, but um, I believe this, I, I did some cross hatching and I kind of tiled it in. Using software. Using software, yeah. In fact, I will say that I believe, if I remember right, all of this ink in here is digital ink. But I do use real ink, so we can uh, maybe show some demonstrations of that in a bit. This one wasn't done with ink, but this was done with pencil. It gives a little bit of a different flavor, but um, you can see that some of the marks are, are pretty similar in a lot of ways. The reasons that you make marks are literal, but yeah. for me it wouldn't be literal, so I'm trying to figure out a way how to incorporate that into my work. Yeah, um, my marks are pretty, uh, they're done in the service of representation, right? So the, the artwork here is meant to tell a story in a kind of a relatively literal way compared to what you do with your painting. Um, but I do think that the marks that we use in illustration have their roots in the same place that a lot of modern abstract art does. And let me show you an example of that. I think that the grandfather of modern, or mid-century illustration, I should say, and a lot of modern art is Marc Chagall. Did a lot of painting that was very fanciful. It, it was really modern for the time. His, his early paintings, I think his earliest paintings came out the turn of the century. There's a lot of what you could argue is maybe abstract expressionism going on kind of in the background, but he's also using a lot of marks here as well. Um, and here you see he goes even further. It's really leaning into the mark making here mm. and, and the, the, the painting is pushed back. You can see the marks over here are actually pretty sharp. So that's clearly either a fine pointed brush or perhaps a crow quill pen. It's hard to say. There's a lot of wonderful textures going on here. A lot of the sorts of things that you see in abstract expressionism, but it's kind of put together in a little bit more of a representative way. So you see how the, this is kind of a, a blend of what ended up being a couple of different disciplines. Now on this one, this is nice because there it looks like a dry brush, thick, and then he goes in with some really, like I don't know what that thin line is under there, but that. My feeling is that those red lines were probably his initial marks that he used to guide his drawing over the top. And we may not really, he may not have intended us to see those lines. So Mark Chagall is, is somebody to check out if you're, if you're interested in um, seeing kind of that confluence of illustration and abstract art. This is another really great one here. I really like this one a lot. If your eye starts moving around this, you notice that there's all this detail happening in here. But at the same time, it's very much uh, a kind of a composition, uh, a painting composition. Mark Chagall influenced a lot of mid-century illustrators that are my heroes. And I'll, I'll just show a couple of examples. There's so many that I love, but I'm gonna show um, an example of artwork by uh, Martin and Alice Provinson. You don't even have to look very hard to see the Chagall influence here. There's a lot of that same kind of thing going on where there's a lot of washes of color and really the line work is kind of just mapped over the top of it. The, mm. the color fields don't even really fit all the time exactly to the uh, line work. Um, the Provinsons were a husband-wife illustration team from uh, the 1940s, 50s. I believe they may have worked with Disney briefly. A lot of illustrators back then did. You can see that in these examples, 
they've pulled away from the painting aspect and they've, they're, they're, they're looking a little bit more literally at the, um, at the representational part. And it's, there's a lot more geometry going on here. Yeah, and look at the texture on the sheep too. I don't even know what that is, but it's pretty great. There's a couple in here where you can see there's much more of a painted background, but again, really in the service of representation. It's not super abstract. It just has some abstract, right. there are textures that you might see in an expressionist painting. Another hero of mine is Ludwig Bemelmans. Uh, he's most famous for the uh, Madeline books, but uh, I like this one a lot. Um, this is uh, Sunshine from probably the 1950s. There's just so much great stuff going on here. It, it, I mean, look at all these textures and lines going on here, and, and yet there's a, this loose painterly feel here. Same thing here. I mean, the snow is just a festival of marks. Another one, the airport here is pretty wild. <laughs> I wish I could be more loose like this. I really like this one. You can see how it's raining here, <clears throat> and all of his marks are kind of going up and down here to kind of support that idea that there's a downpour. Even, even some of the architectural marks have, have kind of this vertical line feel to them, so the whole thing feels like everything's streaming down, which is really interesting. You've got these white marks down here. Look like this, it looks like the street is wet. He's using it for snow on the trees, and then it looks like there's a bunch of birds, and he's just kind of using uh, the same paint and making uh, a, just a, a combination of, of marks to give you a different impression using the same sort of tool to make those marks. I would love to see some of the tools that you use. I would love to see you use some of my tools and I would love to see you give some examples of the mark making. Can we do that? Sure. The first thing I use for almost all my projects is a pencil, just a mechanical pencil. This is a, a, a Pentel twist erase. Let's say we want to do some kind of a character here and, you know, I'm intentionally kind of just being a little bit loose with my lines here. But uh, some of my lines aren't connecting. Some of them are. I want to just have kind of a, I want to give a loose idea of, of where everything is, but I don't, I don't want to be super detailed. And so we got this guy here, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a few little dashes and nicks and dots here, which are really going to help reinforce the lines and give us a sense of volume. Um, this is not the greatest drawing I've ever done, but you get the idea. I'm, I'm a big fan of copying. I, I actually like to find illustrators that I like, and I like to copy what they're doing and, and practice that a little bit, and then kind of forget about it, but it, that sort of sticks in the back of my head a little bit, and it starts to influence the way that I make my marks. My marks are never going to look exactly like anyone else's marks, because it's just like a signature, yeah. right? Let's just throw some cross-hatching in here for shading. Um, and it's really just making parallel lines like this. And you know, see how I've kind of lightened that up as I, as I move away. It's kind of creating a little bit of a denser feel down here. And then you can take, and if you want to make this even darker down here, you can kind of cross it like that. Same thing over here. And I'm not being super detailed about it. Uh, I just want a general effect. And I could do this, let's say this guy has a little bit of a belly here. We could do that here to show a little bit of that. A guy like this might be the basis for a more refined drawing later. Mm -hmm. I do like using real ink. Looks like you got it at the office store. It, it does look like an office pen. Um, it just so happens that this pen works well with carbon ink. And I like to use carbon bullet ink because mm -hmm. it's waterproof. And when you say waterproof, you mean it just, it's permanent. I mean, it's not just permanent, it's bulletproof permanent because there's permanent inks and then there are bulletproof permanent inks. And the bulletproof permanent inks mean that when they're dry, you can put whatever you want over the top of it and they're not going to bleed. Regular waterproof ink, it's a lot of inks say they're waterproof, but they'll still, they'll still start to bleed if they get too wet. Mm. Repeated squiggles 
And again, one of the nice things that I like to do with, may, may not be practical for, for what you're doing because it lends itself more towards realism, but um, just having these darker shadows down here as they get lighter and lighter, you just make the mark, you move the marks further and further away. I feel like it takes some patience too, and maybe that's why I struggle with texture because yeah. I'm not very patient. Yeah. Seems like you have to have that sort of mentality. Just as painters probably have recipes for what they do, I definitely have recipes for what I do. Mm -hmm. I call them recipes. It's like mm -hmm. I have a few steps that I generally use and then I will branch off from there if I need to do something a little bit different to serve the purpose of a particular book or project. I can get a, a, a thin line like that. About the thickest line I can get out of it though is like mm -hmm. this and you can see it starts to want to break up a little bit if I, if I splay it too much. On the other hand, I have uh, a dip pen here, also using carbon ink, that um, I can use to get a, a wider line. It's been a little while since I've used this. Let's see if it still works. Don't knock it over. <laughs> it seems like if you put the ink on the right. Yeah, I could put it up here. <laughs> this is actually, a, that's a good point. This is, if you got this all over stuff, it'd be hard to get it off. Um, and it's, very, it's a very heavy glass container with a very heavy bottom. So it's not likely I'm gonna tip that over. Okay. Um, but you can get, I a, would. you can get, a, you can see, I can get a wider range of lines out of this. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. It, it, and this happens in your world. This probably becomes, becomes a happy accident. Yeah. For me, a lot of times it's an accident accident yeah. and I have to mop it up or put white out over it uh -huh. or whatever. Yeah. I like those yeah. kind of things. Are those mainly the tools that you use? What if you want a thicker line? What if you want a more chunky texture? I use general. General's charcoal pencils to be almost more than anything else. Unlike the ink, they give you a, a wider range of line thickness and you pick up a lot of the paper texture. One of the things I like to do is I like to vary the pressure mm -hmm. as I'm doing it because it gives you a, a feel of kind of coming in and out, thick and thin. Um, and here you can see I'm kind of um, creating a field by just using these vertical lines like this. I think the limit is your imagination. I think you can come up with any mark that you want to and just start repeating it and see what happens. Here, let me use a little bit bigger tool. And this, I think, is one of yours. This is your... your Stabilo. Your, your, yeah, Stabilo. Yeah. I don't know how you say Stabilo that. Stabilo Woody Pencil, which I'm not really familiar with, but I played with it a little bit earlier before we started shooting this, and I really like it. It's water-soluble. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. If you want to inject something that feels a little bit intense, your marks might be kind of like this, you know, there's a kind of intensity here. You might want to spend a little bit of time away from your painting and just get out a piece of paper and then just work out a bunch of different shapes. So you can really just focus on that and start to memorize and learn those shapes. Yeah. Uh, and then those will become a little bit more second nature and you mm. can integrate those uh, when you're in the act of painting. Um, That's a really good point. And for me, I think my, li my library or vocabulary of marks has just grown over time. Mm -hmm. There's one other ink tool that I wanted to share, and that is these, um, I think these are Pentel. Um, they're like a, they're, they're a plate pen, so rather than having a, uh, a croquil tip, it's two plates of metal that are um, pressed together and the ink goes through that, which gives you a really nice sort of calligraphic feel to the line and you can really do a lot of variable line width with that. You know, you could start off just doing one line like this, you twist it a little bit and you get a little bit of a, a thicker or thinner line depending on what you're doing and it gives you this nice variety. And you know, when I'm doing lines like this, I kind of, I don't use, I don't generally use and you may do it differently, but I don't generally use my wrist to do it. I pull my whole arm kind of across like this. Mm -hmm. So mm, that's nice. So it gives it a, a relative straightness. But you can see that I'm also letting it be free and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to make a super straight line. In fact, I'm purposefully kind of twisting it and moving it a little bit as I go just to give it a kind of a, a warm textural feeling. So that's that one. This one is, this one here is the same. Uh, kind of tool, but I think it's a little bit wider. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, it's the same. It's the same idea, but uh, it has just got a wider plate on it. And these are pretty widely available. You can get these at Amazon or wherever you get your supplies. The paper I'm using has some texture, so you see how it's breaking this up here. I really like that. That kind of rough feel to the edge. I, I feel like it's something that people respond to because it's imperfect. 
yeah. and it's broken up and, and people aren't perfect. And I think there's something on the subconscious level that registers with people. When you see a perfectly drawn line, it gives you a sense of maybe admiration for being able to do that. But there's more of a warm feeling towards something I think that has uh, a, a little bit of error to it or a little bit of wiggliness or whatever. And I don't know why that is, but it seems to be the case. Relatable. It's more relatable. On a larger piece, you might want to use bigger materials like this. Uh, so you get that, that really big, uh, chunky feeling here. Let's say that this is like the wood grain and maybe it just kind of splits up like that. Oh, I love that. And, and maybe up here, there's another one that you can kind of go around. And, and so you can really Ooh. play with this a lot. So it's not really straight lines. They're, they're kind of branching off a little bit like this. And, it, it, and, and, and I also let it skip sometimes because it just has that human warmth. And I think that's true of broken lines too. If you want to have kind of a stitch look, mm -hmm. um, that's certainly an option. I, I might do something like this where you, you, know, you, mm. you, you, you kind of mix up different shapes, like it's a rock wall or something like this. And sometimes I will do this as an exercise and then it might devolve into something else. Like when I actually go to use it, it might actually end up looking more like this, you know. I, I always want to do botanicals, but I don't really have a background in illustration. I mean, I can draw, but I always feel like I lose patience when it comes to botanicals, like leaves and things like that. Yeah. You have a really good patience for that, I've noticed. And do you have an example of some in your books there? You know, uh, here's an example of just using some leaf shapes and mm. some some other uh, some other elements from outdoors that um, help me create this pattern for the end papers for the book. Th there's some value in doing things from memory because it's going to have your stamp on it a little bit more. It's going to go through your filter of memory and what you remember things looking like, which is not necessarily what they actually look like. And that may or may not be a true maple leaf, but you know, I'm, I'm going to think, okay, that, 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 that's a possibility. Maybe that looks like that. And, uh, there, mm. what are the, what are these, um, the money plant, the money plant. Yeah. That's kind of a fun shape, right? Yeah. I love that. It's kind of almost, almost like circles, all kinds of leaves. You know, there might be some that kind of hang down like this. I have to draw a lot of grass. Uh, in fields and things like that that I'm representing. So, you know, obviously grass, that's going to be maybe a series of lines like this. Some cattails. How about lily pads? Lily maybe with, with a lotus mm, or something like that. Nice. Yeah. And I'm using a, a Posca pen right now. Sunflower, let's say you want to start with the middle of it and you're going to, you can use some marks like this to kind of get a few pieces here that I painted some textures on and I normally don't work this way normally I use lines and layer them with textures and line and texture and line but I avoided using any line work and then I have this one piece of paper that I just transferred the extra palette paper I don't know if there's anything on there that's interesting to you let's start with this did you have an orientation in mind here no I'll let you pick <laughs> Texture 
colors going on there, I think. And I'm just having fun making marks. I, I, I can't say that this makes coherent sense to me yet, but I think I could probably keep working on this and get it to a certain point. And then maybe you could put something on it and then I could put some, and I think that after we go back and forth, I think it would turn into something really cool. It does sort of make a, a little bit more sense of the painting. This one was Steve's first. I don't think he's very happy with it, but <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun to play. He was. I think he was still kind of learning the materials, and some of these are not his tools. They're my tools. Are you working on any children's books? I've taken a break from doing illustration for a little while, but I might get back into it. One of the things in my, in my work so far is it's been largely digital, and when I work with this real medium and work with real paint, it's kind of inspiring because it suggests new pathways. Yeah, I learned a lot today, and I think that I can take some of what Steve has shown me and apply it to my paintings. Thank you so much for joining me. Did you have fun? I did have fun, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome.